do to empower women in the workplace and in starting businesses? I think uh, making sure that they know that their voices are being heard and continuing to encourage them um, to go forward with an idea when they might be scared or when they're not sure it might work out. Uh, and I think, like I said earlier, hearing from women who've already done that, who have taken that leap of faith and who have found success is so inspirational and so helpful to hopefully help other women achieve the same goals. Next, we're going to welcome Kate Rogers, who's from CNBC. She's the en entrepreneur reporter. And this is the role of small businesses. I am CNBC's small business and entrepreneurship reporter. So as part of my job, I travel all over the country meeting entrepreneurs doing all kinds of innovative and inspirational things. And one of my favorite parts of that job is meeting inspirational women like the ones we're going to introduce you to on this panel here today. So you guys can come on up. <laughs> All right, so to my left here, we have Emily Nunez Cavnes of Sword and Plow. I had the honor of interviewing her earlier this summer at White House Demo Day. So Emily's company is a quadruple bottom line company. They're repurposing military surplus into fashionable handbags. They're very cute and stylish. Uh, they also donate 10% of their profits back to veteran organizations. And Emily is still an active duty service member. They also employ vets at every stage of the process in their business. So thank you for being here. Next to me here, we have Dana Donafrey of Anna Ono. Now, this is a company that creates intimates for women who've undergone breast surgery to help them feel confident and sexy again post-surgery. Dana's also a breast cancer survivor herself. Five years cancer-free this yeah. September, you said? Yeah. And the company is also donating 5% of its proceeds back to breast cancer charities. Next to her, we have Christine Souffrant of Vendity. Now, this is a social enterprise that connects global travelers to local street vendors via mobile technology, a $10 trillion industry, you said? And it was not digitized before, so she's helping democratize and digitize an industry and bring it online in a way that's never been done. And she also comes from three generations of Haitian street vendors. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. <laughs> And then finally, uh, next to her, Anna Stork, co-founder of Luminade. Anna co-founded Luminade as a grad student right after the Haitian earthquake. Uh, they are an inflatable solar light that packs flat. Today, the innovation's been used in more than 70 countries in all kinds of disaster situations. She also pitched on Shark Tank and got the company's first ever investment from Mark Cuban. Not an easy feat. So as you can see, we have quite the powerful lineup here today. Uh, one thing that we all know that holds women back in the, work, in the workplace, rather, and becoming, from becoming entrepreneurs is the confidence gap and fear. So I want to ask each one of you, because you're all doing very different and very innovative things. And Anna, I'll start with you uh, to my right here. Were you scared to get started? If so, how did you overcome that fear? And I know yours was part of an assignment, right, in grad school. So I'm sure there was a little bit more of a safety net. But tell us how you overcame the fear of getting started. Yeah, so, so I started uh, Luminade with my co-founder while we were graduate school for architecture at Columbia. Um, and we had the whole semester to really design a product that could help with disaster relief aid. So we decided to focus on lighting. We were really fortunate, I think, because we had the benefit or the safety net of being in school and really having that semester to experiment and prototype. Um, and then I think what really helped our confidence is the more that we shared our idea and the more that we vocalized it and illustrated it for people even though it was still just an idea the more support we got and the more kind of accountable we felt for per continuing to pursue it um, so I think that really helped build our confidence over time throughout that year and a half that we were in school kind of still working on it we did a lot of business plan competitions and things like that and the more that we shared mm -hmm. the more confidence we got and Christine, what about you? Because you were bringing something mm -hmm. online that had never been done before, and you told mm -hmm. me that people didn't really quite get the concept. So what was your biggest fear? How did you overcome it? 
think the con- there wasn't really an issue of fear or starting Vendetti because it's very hard for people to get it at first, but when you grow up around something and you've seen it live, not only through my upbringing in Haiti, but I traveled 30 countries, mm-hmm. um, tracking the stories of street vendors globally. So it was something personally rooted in me and something that I knew was happening. And plus, when I started Vendetti, I already was taking a leap of faith with my own life goals. I quit banking and moved to Dubai with never being there before and starting my track to entrepreneurship when I was there. So it wasn't a matter of fear, it was a matter of, of like, what was the best strategy to get the world to come on board to understand that this matters. I mean, you can't have this concept of t- four billion people are coming online regardless in the next decade. Mm-hmm. And this $10 trillion dollar economy is happening off the black market that's never been a part of the global supply chain. It's gonna happen, I'm just saying take the bet on me to be the one to be the first to do it. Okay. So that was the difference. Great. Yeah. And Dana, what about you? You told me, you know, obviously having been diagnosed with breast cancer, you kind of started this business out of passion. Were you fearful at all to get started? Yeah, I think um, when I launched Anna Ono, you know, the, the biggest part for me was that I knew that women needed to feel beautiful after their surgery because once you lose a piece of your femininity, it's a very tough struggle. And um, if something beautiful is such if a piece of lingerie can do that for you, I, I knew I needed to do this mission. I knew I needed to like take the leap of faith and go out and try to do this on my own. So I guess for me, that the fear wasn't failure in the sense of women not liking my product. Um, of course, there's always this monetary drive to, to do something. So I knew I was going to do it even if it wasn't a business. If it was just going to be a hobby, it was going to get done. So I guess my, my failure line was very low. <laughs> um, so I was able to encourage myself and build some confidence that I knew maybe it might not be, you know, the next largest retailer, but I knew it was an important product. Okay, great. And Emily, what about you? Um, so when I first thought of the idea for Sword and Plow, I was a senior at Middlebury College, and I was also an Army ROTC cadet, and mm-hmm. I was working on my thesis and training hard to commission as an officer and lead soldiers, and so I was really busy, and I thought of this exciting idea and so for the first few days I was a little nervous and cautious and wondered do I even have time to do this Mm -hmm. to the extent that I want it to be and um, a week later my sister and co-founder Betsy who's here um, (laughs) she came up to visit me from Boston and we were having lunch and I casually told her about the idea and she was so excited she said oh my gosh, we are doing this. <laughs> and we continued the lunch for about six hours and went rushed back to my apartment and matched up some of my ROTC gear with purses and knew that this was going to be an idea that could solve a lot of social problems mm-hmm. and be fun too. And so since that lunch, we haven't looked back and just charged on since then. Great, and actually I'm gonna follow up with that question because many of the women on this panel actually have a social mission that's attached to their business. And a lot of times you hear criticism, you know, can you really do good and also be profitable and you're bucking that trend. So why is that important to you? If you wanna explain to everybody the quadruple bottom line, what that means and how you're able to do good and still make money. Sure, so yeah, Sword and Plow, we're really proud of the fact that we do have a quadruple bottom line. And for us, that refers to um, focusing on people, a distinct purpose, the planet, and making a profit. And for us, um, people, we're focused on empowering veteran employment and um, supporting American jobs. Um, our distinct purpose is uh, bridging the civil military divide. For the planet, we repurpose thousands of pounds of military surplus material that would otherwise be wasted, and we donate 10% of our profits back to different veteran organizations. Um, and so for Sword and Plow, when we first thought of the idea, our goal was to help solve those problems mm-hmm. before we even thought about becoming a business. But um, by being a for-profit social enterprise, we're really able to scale quickly and support all of those four bottom lines. Okay, great. So we all know that building a business of any size is a huge challenge, whether you know it's a laundromat or like what Christine is doing, building a global business. Can you tell us what your biggest challenge has been in building something that you are seeing used all over the world and that you want to continue to grow even bigger? Yeah, I think the several challenges, but at first um, it was definitely trying to get people to understand why it actually matters. 
um, because it's very hard for people to care about something that they feel like they are disconnected to. Um, I mean, in today's world, I mean, I feel like we're more conscious about what's happening globally because we're more interconnected. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, you could see something that's happening abroad and see on TV and go back to your daily lives. You can't do that anymore. Um, so the concept of Vendetti was the fact that people travel all the time. And many times when people travel, it's funny how we are tired of buying generic souvenir items at local shops and you know, boutique stops, but a lot of those products are bought for chump change in local street markets and sold at higher margin amounts um, at these boutique shops. Whereas if you go directly to the vendor, not only have better experience connected with the people of the local culture, but also um, supporting someone that actually deserves the right to what they actually created. Um, and so getting that concept through to people at first was very difficult because again, um, people have their own world that they live in. But second, I think scaling um, a concept that's more so focused on emerging economies is very hard because I just came back from Silicon Valley this week. Mm -hmm. Very myopic, you know, they're constantly looking for pattern recognition, right? They think the next big thing is gonna be another Zuckerberg, it's gonna be another Airbnb, another Uber, because they see the same pattern every time, and they're losing out on the right away of opportunities that's coming that's right before their eyes, but they're just not looking at it because they're seeing regular patterns. So trying to break that mold and proving, not even proving because it's not really a matter of proving yourself to global communities, but it's just saying that it's there, you're just not looking at it and going for it. So that was very difficult. And do you find that the vendors are, are willing to work with you and they're interested mm -hmm. in the product? Is it a concept that they really understand? Because I'd imagine you mm -hmm. could face some challenges in selling it to them too. Um, definitely challenges, not so much for them to understand. I mean, keep in mind, these people are interacting with millions of people all over, around the world. They're more savvy than you think. So they're interacting, you know, reinventing themselves all the time just naturally. The, um, the pr difficulties is mainly that they've been given so many promises mm -hmm. that they're tired of another one that just falls through. A lot of, no offense to nonprofits or so, uh, social enterprises in the room, but you have you have an honor code to keep. A lot of people go to these communities and do a beta test for two days and then take a couple of pictures and then go off, right? I mean, you need to really understand that people aren't experiments and that, you know, when you're trying to promise something, give the truth that, you know, we might not be able to scale this in six months or a year, but give them the real roadmap so they can understand that. And I think us being honest about that reality really helps. And the fact that they have pictures to see that I grew up around them as well, you know, so... That's something that helps in terms of connecting to the problem because it's something a part of your story. I mean, you're really connected to what you're working on. So that helps a lot with um, credibility in yeah. this type of Absolutely. Thing. Well, you kind of segued into my next question. So I wanted to talk a bit about how your experiences informed your vision for your company because so many people have a great idea, but taking that great idea to a concept and making it into an actual viable business are two very different things. So how did you make the leap? Yeah, a, a lot like Christine, really. Um, you know, it... A lot of my challenge has been informing and educating people that do not go through breast cancer and or do not have reconstructive surgeries or surgeries post cancer diagnosis. So I found, and a lot of times you're, you turn a lot of your efforts into educating and um, explaining to people why is a woman's body so different. Mm -hmm. And so that's really compounded these issues on top of each other because they get expensive, the funding gets hard, people always need a description. But what's great is, is that was my new challenge with um, launching the business, but I came from a very core um, fashion background where I've done a lot of startups, um, a lot of high fashion brands, mass market. So I really ran the gamut throughout my career to give me a foundation that let me know all of the bad things not to do <laughs> and uh, save myself a little bit of money in that process, but then also some really great good things, you know, that, that do affect my business decisions and the way I'm structuring my business yeah, as well. You're also in a saturated market. So did people tell you were crazy to do this? Oh, people thought I was absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, to go up against um, not only the lingerie industry in itself, um, but also, you know, the mastectomy market, but the mastectomy market does not service 40% um, of the women that are diagnosed with breast cancer. They've just been forgotten. So to convince people that this sector is women living with issues um, is, is a big challenge. So it's been, it's been part of my growing and um, my growing pain starting the business. And Anna, I want to turn to you now. So you're also obviously building a global brand. You're partnering with organizations and, and providing disaster relief. How are you getting your product into their hands? How did you take it from the classroom to really a mass scale? Let's see. I mean, there's a lot of, we actually, 
I got this advice from uh, just a family friend who is a longtime entrepreneur, and he he saw like our first prototype that we had made by hand. I have my like so this is what it looks like now. It's just a little solar lantern that packs up like this, and then you inflate it with this valve, and it uh, it's like a little lightweight light. Um, and he saw that prototype, and he was like, "Go take it to the Red Cross. Like, go take it. Just take that prototype and see if you can sell it." And I thought that was a little too early, <laughs> but we actually started building those relationships really early on. And so, like all of our the organizations that we work with, they we structure that relationship. Like, we want to design this product for you. Like, we want it to be useful for you and also for the people that you're distributing it to. Like, give us feedback. Like, let us. And we we've continued to improve the product based on their feedback, and that's really helped us like they're part of our growth and um that's just really strengthened those relationships with those organizations okay great uh so can you tell us how you've in incorporated customer feedback into what you're doing and feedback from the military community into the growth of sword and plow sure so it's been really interesting being an active duty army officer mm -hmm. and also a co-founder of sword and plow because um a big portion of our customers are in the military or have family members are, that are in the military. Mm -hmm. So it's been really exciting to receive that feedback and immediately be able to um, implement it. And one of my favorite things about hearing from customers is their personal stories about why they're connected to Sword and Plow. And right after we launched on Kickstarter in 2013, I deployed to Afghanistan and um, we had a lot of orders to fulfill. So still running her business while deployed, in case you missed that. <laughs> Proving that you really can do it all, but okay, continue. We also have an amazing team mm -hmm. with Betsy <laughs> and the rest of the team. But um, so uh, one day I received this package in the mail with an address from Georgia and a man's name that I didn't, didn't recognize. And I open it up and inside I see photos of someone in a military uniform and they're all black and white. and. It, and a handwritten letter from um, a Vietnam veteran who saw our Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. and told us that what we were doing really meant a lot to him, that we were trying to give back to this community. And he, um, wrote, uh, he wrote about his experience in Vietnam and had these photos and sent playing cards and cookies for me to share with uh, my soldiers. So it receiving feedback on that very personal level to receiving an email or a, a design idea from um, someone about what they would like to see has been one, one of the best parts of running a business. Okay, well we would be um, foolish to skip over funding, which is such a huge issue for so many small businesses. And I know Dana, you mentioned that that was one of your biggest challenges in starting up. So how did you overcome the funding gap? Where, where did you receive funding from and, and how did you go about doing that? Well, <laughs> anybody interested? Um, no, you know, <laughs> just throwing that out there. Um, it, it's a challenge. I mean, I am quite conservative, so I, I really wanted to make sure I had proof of concept um, before I really started reaching out for too much funding. I've completely funded this um, line myself um, up until this point. So um, it's been great because I've, you know, competed in several competitions throughout the year. One of them is the Intuit Small Business Big big game contest. Mm -hmm. um, I've won $10,000 grant, you know, through some of these competitions and um, that's really helped continue to propel it forward. So it's awesome that there's been platforms out there for us that if you have a good idea but you don't, you know, you're not really ready for big capital yet, mm -hmm. you know, that you still have an opportunity to get some cash flow into your business. Um, but now it's now it's taking the, the turning point. So now I am up against, you know, finding capital, people that are interested, the right investor, you know, all of those challenges, which is a scary moment, you know, when you're starting a small business because um, you don't want to lose too much control. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that you have a mission, and I'm, I'm so close to that mission. It's very important to me to stay connected. So um, getting all of those pieces to the pie together is, is a big task for a small business because it, it ends up taking a lot of your work while you're also running a business. Great. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Intuit, and I know Anna and Christine, you also both participated in the MasterCard competition. So Christine, I'll start with you. Uh, tell me how you heard about that, what it did for your business. You both won grants from them. So tell us what you're doing with the cash and how it felt to win. Yeah. 
I mean, similar to um, Dana's story is that we definitely spent the first year just trying to proof concept into several competitions globally, both in the U.S. and Dubai and other places. And MasterCard was the only one that wasn't planned because um, I was actually competing for another competition, um, the Shiva's Venture Million Dollar Prize. I was representing the USA, and we were going through a voting period. So I went to Brooklyn to get other people to vote for our, our company. So it's just basically walking up to random pe people, getting them to vote for us. And I saw the elevator booth, and it was the second day about to close up. And I said, I'll just take a chance and just go at it on a limb and just had fun. And left, got a call to come back. They were rushing me to come back. I didn't know why. Um, dur during the interview process, I found out I was the winner. It was 15K. And for me, I just thought it was really ironic because that's the, the amount of money I spent for my credit cards and kind of maxed out my credit and my credit <laughs> score. <laughs> you know, a couple months earlier. So it was kind of like, oh, my God, like hindsight. Like, this is awesome. And so it was definitely good. Um, because at that point we proven proof of concepts in different ways in different countries. So now we had at least a little funding to help with app development and personally for um, our company and just also to pay down some of the credit card bills I have because in the event that I can't raise the capital that I need from smart investors, mm -hmm. so I still have the credit to still push forward because this is happening. Yeah. Regardless of you know the funding investors to get it, it's happening if I have to pull the credit. Um, and so it was very helpful in that regard and also Funding is one thing, but you need more than that. You need partners, you need exposure. And the thing about these competitions, it kind of validates what you're doing, because our video got 400,000 views. Mm -hmm. um, you can't argue with that. And a lot of those viewers, um, because we get contradictory feedback all the time from partners, from investors, from your friends, from your networks, customer feedback says a lot. And 400,000 viewers, many of them were asking, can you put street food on the network? We were focused on street products. We never even considered really to really push street food. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that really resonated with people. So funding was one thing, but we also got a better concept of like, okay, milestones, let's try to incorporate what they're saying. So the exposure and marketing also helps as well. Great. And yeah. Anna, you got a ton of exposure from that, I'm sure, and also Shark Tank. So tell us what that experience was like and what that's done for your business. Yeah, sure. So in terms of funding, um, we did... We did business plan competitions and grants for the first few years of our business, um, and then we and we each put in around seventy five hundred dollars each. My co-founder and I, um, and then we and we also did a crowdfunding campaign um, that provided us with enough money to really start to grow our business and start to sell our product. Um, and then this past, and then we were on Shark Tank, and that's when we took on our first investor. That was around uh, eight months ago, last. February. Um, in the spring, we entered the MasterCard business plan competitions. It was actually right around the time of Nepal. Um, so we were working around the clock um, deploying lights in that emergency. And um, it came at a really perfect time for us because we were bringing on interns to help us facilitate those orders and distributions. And it was just a huge, a huge value add to our company. Um, and just to have that support from a company like MasterCard was really, really meaningful. And Emily, what about you? How, what did Intuit do for you? And what did that exposure and I'm sure feedback you got um, from participating uh, do for the company? Sure. Um, the Intuit QuickBooks Small Business Big Game competition was such an incredible opportunity for Sword and Plow because it really uh, pushed our whole team to get out of our co comfort zone mm -hmm. and do everything that we could to try to win. And even though we weren't a top three finalist, I think every finalist was a huge winner because we grew our community by thousands of people and uh, we were trying to do everything we could to get the word out and all of the articles and press that was released about Sword and Plow in this competition I think received over 90 million impressions and um, it was our second best sales quarter ever and so it was an amazing experience and we're just so grateful for being part of the Intuit um, small, business, small Business Big Game competition and for being here, too. Yeah, so. absolutely, absolutely. I'm curious to hear, since you guys are all you know, on the ground, in the field, what you think, and I'll start with you, Dana, what you think the, the one thing, we talked about fear, we talked about confidence, the one thing that's holding women entrepreneurs back from growing and, and starting their own companies? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to, to have a little bit of fear um, in the beginning, I, I talk to a lot of women and they, you know, they're always like, oh, I have this idea, I have this thing, but I'm just, I don't know how to do it, I don't know how to start. So, 
you know, maybe the education isn't there. Maybe people don't feel enough access to courses. But um, I know something I'm really in the weeds with right now is is even just to become women certified yeah. business. You, yeah, you mentioned government regulations or sometimes are a challenge challenging because you yeah, you're you're a small business. Your uh, your bandwidth is is very limited, and you know I'm a business founded by a woman for women, operated by a woman. And the amount of paperwork and processes I have to go to prove to the government that is actually the case is, is really deterring for a, a business of my size. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but then you have to hire a consultant because the consultant knows how to do the paperwork. And now it becomes a massive expense for you as well. So I think a lot of that, you know, there's a, a huge door that can be opened just by being a woman-owned business, but we're shutting it on ourselves. Okay. So it's just important to try to, you know, figure out better ways to mainstream that. And Christine, what, what's something that you would say might be hindering women both here and abroad since you're connected to both networks? Yeah, and I, I actually launched Vendetti from Dubai, so I actually had a lot of support as a female in the Middle East and some parts of the U.S., sorry to say. But one thing I will say is that I think, you know, women go through the same entrepreneurial challenges as men, so it's the same emotional roller coaster, the same operational um, obstacle, so it's not really a difference. I do think we need to stop telling women before they get into an entrepreneurial path that they have so many roadblocks ahead of them because men are not faced with that reality. They're not told that you're not going to make it. You're not told these statistics. Granted, we need to know about it, but I think, you know, we should start showcasing more females and say that, you know, we have rock stars there. Just because you don't want to highlight them in the magazines doesn't mean they aren't there because many times when... Um, in college, you go back. I go back to colleges and have these talks. And when they see someone coming back home, you know, in their communities, they say, "Wow, like it's happening. Like, why am I hearing all these statistics? I could just go out there." Mm -hmm. And the more of those faces you see, uh, it really does help. And I think, secondly, because you met with all these different impressions, we take things personally. Yeah. And I wish, if I could tell my younger self that a year ago, to just stop taking things personally. Mm -hmm and stop wasting mental bandwidth on what the person could have been thinking, why they were thinking, because I can't help someone who has a gender bias. I just gotta keep chugging, because my mom would say, diamonds are made out of pressure, just keep going. And so I think if we just put that into our mental capacity and just keep going, yeah. it can help, because we're gonna go through the same challenges as men. We know what we're up against, but we need to realize that there are rock stars out there. So. And you told me, I asked in our pre-interview yeah. how you tune out critics, and you said you just don't listen to them at all. I don't. I mean, unless it's something that could help me mm -hmm. um, pivot or make my business better, I'll listen. But if it's something that you came with generations of feedback to think that that's what it is, that a woman can't lead a business, I'm not wasting my time with you. I'm going to keep going. Yeah, yeah. And, you and I'll ask you now what you think the one thing that, that could be holding women back here in the U.S. and also abroad from, from really launching into this and getting started. It's a hard question. I, I think there are so many resources out there for women to leverage and a lot of women support groups for entrepreneurs. And I think it's a matter of finding those. Um, I think one tip of advice that I have for women entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs or any type of entrepreneur is to stay really light on your feet and don't be set in like one particular kind of vision for your company from the go. Like I think for us, like it's been very important to diversify our sales channel. So we sell to disaster relief aid organizations. We sell to Amazon. We sell to the container store. We sell to, so it's really actually, and it's allowed our business to grow. And in the end, we are having a greater impact as a result of being able to scale, to scale our business financially. Um, so I think that's really important. If you want to have a social impact, you, it's 100% okay to diversify your sales channels and grow your business. hear what you think the biggest challenges or the biggest thing holding some women back from getting started? Um, I think the biggest thing that holds women back is that so many women especially have amazing innovative ideas mm -hmm. but um, talk themselves out of doing it mm -hmm. before they even get started. And I think taking that first step is so crucial because you'll learn along the way. Um, our Sword and Plow team, no one had very specific um, a very specific background in fashion or um, in marketing or supply chain management. And we've learned a lot from mentors um, and by ourselves along the way. And so I think the best thing you can do is to take the first step and just begin. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't do that, uh, it won't happen. And uh, 
So Anna, you mentioned being lighter on your feet. And Christine, you brought up to me that, you know, you had fears that this might not work because you had started out with the wrong product, the, the, the wrong vision for the network that you were trying to build. Can you tell us what you learned from that experience and how you were able to pivot and become successful? Yeah, I mean, when you run into a lot of friction in the market, I mean, it's kind of hard to ignore it. I mean, they say um, business plans go out the window once you meet your first customer, right? And so that's what happened. Um, and I remember, I mean, my team is right here in the room, Mikhail, Martin, Shayla, and my partner in crime, Einstein. So they know what we went through when we first started in Haiti. And what was happening is that even though we were training vendors about the marketplace, is that they weren't getting immediate sales right they were making money they would be able to make money faster but there was there was still a leap of faith with e-commerce right you don't know if that product is going to sell in three months six months nine months at a time and so because of that you're scaling all your resources to train vendors to have access to a network with no with a high turn rate and that's what all our competitors were doing because they were still making profits so we realized maybe we were targeting the wrong people targeting everybody doesn't make sense even though we think that everyone will be interested in these products but we realized there was a group of people that did have a pain point, and that was travelers. And so once we started talking to travelers and talking to different people in that sect, we realized that it was easier to have a network effect. Because a lot of these businesses, if you could let the network happen on its own, so you're not building an operational base from scratch, it scales faster and it scales more efficiently. For, for example, we did a campaign, and within the first 48 hours, we received close to 340s across 40 different countries during that time frame because we targeted the right people. So I think when you have friction in the market, listen to it, um, because we do get stubborn about our vision and what we want, because I'm, I was a street vendor, so I think I knew so much about the network myself. Um, but you'd be surprised what happens in the market. And maybe it might not be the end vision, but just take the little curves and the pivots when you need to and listen to the market traction. And that's what we did. And as a result, I think it's going in a better direction. So once we launch a beta this fall, like it's going to be a lot easier to get the, or the network to work on its own from yeah. scratch. And I think that happens in a lot in businesses. Absolutely. Yeah. And Dana, did you ever experience any point in, in launching that you thought that this might not happen or you were building the wrong type of product? What type of feedback were you getting from people? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, nobody was doing this yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a massive media wave mm -hmm. that challenged one of the major retailers to carry a survivor line um, and offer a mastectomy bra. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a total creative meltdown. <laughs> and I thought, oh, how am I going to do this? How can I go up against these giants? Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm dead in the water. This is it. I'm, I'm not working fast enough. But I had a really awesome advisory board and supportive friends that were helping me launch the business. And everybody picked me up, put me back on my feet. And I said, you know what? This is, this does have to be done. It has to be done by me. So um, thankfully, that major retailer turned it down. <laughs> and then I was able to take a really big deep breath and um, continue on with the mission. And you know, since then, uh, the survivor feedback from women around the world has been so intense. And um, so uplifting and so encouraging and women telling me about their problems that they're having and ideas for new products and um, doctors reaching out to me partnering with uh, products for their patients so it's really just been an amazing you know space to be exposed to such a wide audience around the world and you know to help these women in their recovery and Anna since you launched in grad school I'm curious to know your thoughts on education and opportunities especially for young girls do you think we're doing enough to educate young women on entrepreneurship as a career opportunity and as a choice that they actually have for their future I think all the well I think all the stem programs that are um, kind of increasing in you know in their becoming more and more widespread are really important and integrating entrepreneurship within that STEM program I think is also really important. Like I was, I studied engineering and then architecture and I didn't have too much exposure to entrepreneurship and I wish that that was a little bit more integrated into, into my education uh, within those either engineering or architecture. So I do think we need to continue to integrate it into our curriculum but I think that there's a lot of headway that's being made. Now I'm going to turn back to you. Tell us what your biggest challenge overall has been and what you learned from it. Um, our biggest challenge, I think, was um, right after we launched on Kickstarter in April of 2013, um, three weeks later, I deployed to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember landing in Kandahar Airfield um, on my very first day, and I received an email from Beth, my sister Betsy. And I thought it was going to say something like, hey, Emily, how are you doing? Hope you arrived safely. Mm -hmm. And she did say that. <laughs> um, but then she said, hey, Em, um, just wondering, where do you find the leather piping on the signature rucksack? Because I need to order 2,000 yards. And it's not a bad problem to have, right? That no, she needed a lot yeah, of it. Yeah, that wasn't a bad problem. Um, we just had a lot to learn about supply chain management and communicating over four different time zones, one being a war zone. Mm -hmm. um, and I told Betsy, um, I think I found that leather on eBay. And she said, eBay, eBay is not going to be a long-term um, supply chain source. So <laughs> sorry about that. So you're not using eBay anymore? No, no, that was just for the sample. So good but. lesson learned. Probably more stress in a high-stress situation. Yeah, but uh, Betsy worked hard to find other sources, and um, we learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I think knowing that we could communicate over four different time zones and 12 hours apart and to successfully launch after Kickstarter, um, we've never really considered giving up as an option after mm -hmm. that. And so, yeah, okay. it was definitely a good learning opportunity. All right, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna just run through the panel. Uh, I'll start over here. Just tell us what's next for your business. We've enjoyed hearing all of your your startup stories, but let us know what you're up to now and what, what the future holds. Sure, so um, this next year, we're really focusing on trying to get into more large retail stores across the country and really increase our social impact. So um, we have sold over 10,000 products yeah. and repurposed over 35,000 pounds of military surplus and supported um, 40 veteran jobs. So we're just trying to increase those numbers as much as we can in this next year and um, share our social mission with as many people as possible. Great. And Dana, tell us what's next for you. Um, yeah, a, a lot's going on, but uh, exciting for next year mm -hmm. is um, new launches of new product. We're actually in the middle of a photo shoot now. I, I use um, all women that have faced breast cancer and, and or have had some surgery because of it um, in all of our photography and all of our uh, marketing and, and the website. And um, so we've got new products coming out. One, I partnered with a, a radiation oncologist at Kaiser Permanente for women that are recovering after their radiation treatment, which is going to be a really amazing garment for these women to feel comfortable in, um, as well as a pocket of mastectomy line. And um, what's been great with a lot of the exposure that's come in the last few months is um, a lot of women sadly lose their jobs um, to their cancer diagnosis. And um, I have an outcry and outpour of women um, that are taking the opportunity of them losing their jobs from their cancer to really do something that they want to do and what they love to do. So um, I have a few volunteers now of um, women that have faced uh, the same issues and hopefully you know, we'll grow big enough to start supporting them and provide jobs as well. So it's a really awesome opportunity. Next for you. Yeah, so um, right after this, head straight to Dubai, um, TEDx Talk and Arabian Business Magazine. So it's a great way to wrap up the year for Vendetti. And next year, just grinding it out. Um, we did a lot of marketing, we got the word out. So people kind of have a grassroots understanding of Vendetti now. So it's a matter of targeting students starting abroad um, next year. It's going to be our first target. So we're going to target several schools around. Um, the country uh, to start getting them using their product in markets are all over the world. And basically, next time you travel is gonna be a common thing to use Vendetti to source global products around the world. That's our end game. That the next thing that you do when you travel is not only take pictures and selfies, but use Vendetti to buy real products, seriously. So that's our goal starting next year. So look Great. for it. All right, and Anna, tell us what's next for Luminate. Right now we're doing a big holiday campaign on our website where you can purchase a light for your friend or family or yourself and donate one to the refugees, uh, Syrian refugees. So we have a few partner organizations that are distributing lights there. 
So we're really, we're really excited to kind of build awareness around that campaign. Uh, next year, we're launching some new products, which we're uh, eager to launch um, and work with some of our disaster relief aid customers to distribute those. They're like phone charger products and different types of solar lighting products. So that will be really exciting. Great. All right, well, thank you all so much. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you to uh, Anna, Christine, Dana, and Emily. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Kate. <laughs>